Song of Solomon. We'll back up to chapter 1. And uh, verse 12, while the king sits at his table, my spikenard sendeth forth the smell thereof. A bundle of myrrh is my well-beloved unto me. He shall lie all night betwixt my breasts. My beloved is unto me as a cluster of camphor in the vineyards of Engedi. Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes. Behold, thou art fair, my beloved. Yes, pleasant. Also, our bed is green. The beams of our house are cedar and our rafters of fir. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight. His fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. Stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand doth embrace me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that you stir not up nor awake my love till he please. Thank you, Father, again for your word. We ask that you would uh, forgive our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Lord. Lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Open up your word to us. We pray that you would give us understanding in it and continue in this book to stir up our hearts uh, toward our spouse as well as as the uh, bride of the Lord Jesus Christ to stir up our hearts toward him. We thank you in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. We ask the Lord to stir up our hearts because his love is always the same toward us. So we come to verse 4, uh, really a, another one of the famous verses of the Song of Solomon. There's, so, there's quite a few of those, actually, that even though there, there's not always a lot of expositions, especially through the whole book, a lot of these texts are very familiar to us. So she has stated that she was the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley, but he stated as a lily among thorns, preferring her above all the others. So my love is among the daughters. And then she states that she prefers him above the others as the apple tree among the trees of the wood. So is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight and his fruit was sweet to my taste so that she enjoyed his company and his character and all of that was sweet to her. Well, in verse four, she says, he brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. He brought me to the banqueting house. Adam Clark writes literally the house of wine, which then we would say a house of joy. The ancients pres preserved their wine not in barrels or dark cellars under the ground like we do, but in large pitchers ranged against the wall in an upper apartment of the house, a place where they kept their most precious effects. Patrick writes, which administers the highest joys to those who taste of them and hath entertained or rather feasted with such delicious hopes that I cannot but glory in this, that I am listed under his banner whose motto is love whereby he hath overcome, shall I say, or overpowered my heart to submit myself wholly unto his wonderful love. And so he says, he brought me to the banqueting house or to the house of wine. He brought me to the house of wine. So in, in this story, she is either considering this as something that would take place or that he has done and he is bringing her into this banqueting house, this house of, of wine and of joy and of feasting. We have the picture of course of Christ at the very end of everything. We've, in fact, we've gotten there in Revelation chapter 19 where we're coming now to the, the wedding banquet. And the wedding banquet was also something that was pictured for us in some of the parables as well. 
Turn to Luke chapter 14. We'll look at it there. In Luke chapter 14, we've already seen in a, on other occasions the fact of this fellowship that happens around meals. And uh, this was true to the ancients. It's true to us still in Luke chapter 14. In verse 15, and when one of them that sat at meat heard these things, what things? Well, we would say from verse 12, he said to them that bade him when you make a dinner or supper, call not your friends or your brethren, neither your kinsmen or rich neighbors, lest they also bid you again and recompense be made you. When you make a feast, call the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. For then thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. This is a teaching that's given to us in different ways in the scriptures. The idea that we don't just do good to those whom we know can do good back to us again. Or be a benefit to somebody that we know will be a benefit to us. But that our hearts should not be uh, as James talks about, um, bigoted in that way, where we're only uh, good folk toward those who can help us, but rather that we should see all men as the mission field, see all men in their needs that they have, and there in verses 12 through 14, that our doing good, our charity, as it's talked about in the book of Matthew in the in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> that it should be toward those who cannot do us any good also. It's not that we don't do things for friends or for those who might do something back, but what he's saying is, is warning us <clears throat> against having the kind of religion that is always looking at the situation and thinking, well, that situation can't really help me, so I'm really not going to mess with that. But this one over here might be profitable to me. So I might get something out of that one. That we should, in our mission as the church and as individuals, look upon souls as just souls. And that <clears throat> there are those within society who cannot help us at all. They're, they're, not gonna, they're not gonna give anything back to us at all. Basically, they are very needy and there's some people that are extremely needy and they're going to need to have something from us which we will ne they will never repay us for. And what he's saying is, is that we need to have that kind of mindset to, to realize that it's better to give than to receive. And that as you scatter upon the water, it'll come back to you. And it'll come back to you in eternal dwellings is what he's saying here as well, recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Well, he gives that, he gives that story and that, that teaching and then in verse 15, one of them that sat at meat heard him, heard these things and said to him, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And so Christ takes that as a segue into this story about the great supper, a great supper from, from a great personage. A certain man made a great supper and he bade many. He was a man of means and a man of wealth. And this supper invitation was an invitation and if there was something certainly providentially that you couldn't make it then he wouldn't be upset but there was an expectation there of great personages that if you were invited to come to their uh, house of banqueting that certainly you would that you would uh, be desirous to come and to be one of the guests and it says he sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come for all things are now ready. And all, they all with one consent began to make excuse. And he goes through the three different excuses. He purposefully makes them flimsy excuses like I bought some land but I hadn't seen it yet and stuff like that just to show that they disregarded the invitation. That it, it, they really didn't, it wasn't really that they had some providential hindrance from it, they just didn't wanna come. picturing for us spiritually the fact that God in Christ, God is the great 
master of the universe, he has bid us come and, and to partake of the riches of his uh, bounty of salvation. He has bid us to come to his feast and to enjoy the feast that he has pre prepared for us and is glad to have us to come and that men spurn that. And it's not that there's some real hindrance to them coming. Um, the only hindrance is their lack of desire to come and to spurn the master. And so it says in verse 21, the servant came and showed the Lord these things and the master of the house being angry, being angry. See, because there was an expectation there. No doubt this man had been a benefactor probably to many of these people. And he desired to be of good use to them again. And they just snubbed him. But of course, as we relate it to God, the Father, he has reason to be angry. When the gospel goes forth, when men are graciously invited to come and partake of the salvation of his dear son, whom he has sent, the son of his love, who, who passes through this terrible ordeal in order to provide salvation. And when the gospel invitation goes out, they just snub it. He says, go quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. So, and, and no doubt, this was a rebuke of the Jews who had had the gospel for thousands of years. They had had the types, the shadows, the prophets, God sending them early and long, killing his prophets and maiming them and uh, refusing it, snubbing it. And so, yes, God's anger was almost to the full to where Jerusalem would be destroyed. So the servant says, it's been done as commanded. There's still room. And the Lord said, go out into the highways, the hedges, compel them to go in to all all kinds of places as far as you can go. And, and a picture, of course, of going to the Gentiles and the nations and the islands, going to the uttermost parts of the earth in order to bring them in and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. It's a great offense to God when his gospel goes forth and men snub it. It's an offense to him. And that's all we can say. And that they will pay for it in the end. If they have been given the gospel and they have mocked it or just ignored it or whatever. So when we come to our text back in Song of Solomon, here is, here is the church. He brought me to his banqueting house. Here is a delight. Here is the church who is glad that she is being brought to the banqueting house, the house of wine. Uh, this, is, this is something wonderful because he has chosen her out and has brought her to this place of celebration. And so she gladly, gladly goes to the banqueting house. Scott writes, he brings the soul to seek and enjoy the comforts that are communicated through his ordinances, which are as a banqueting house where the saints feast with him, making application here to the church and Christ. Christ calls his children to a banquet. And that's what a sermon is supposed to be anyways. It's supposed to be a banquet of good things, the householder bringing out the good things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and his father and the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper these are things that strengthen our faith and raise our faith and are times of rejoicing around the Lord. Benson writes, the places in which believers received the graces and blessings of Christ. And so then he goes on to say in our text, he's, she says, first of all, she's, she is so happy and rejoicing in this. He brought me to his banqueting house, his house of wine. And she goes on to say, and his banner over me was love. Of course, that brings up a tune in some of our minds because we've had a little tunes from that from VBS through the years. But his banner, his banner over me was love. Well, this word for banner 
is used in the book of Numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Twelve times. So twelve times the word for banner is used in the book of Numbers and then once in the Song of Solomon and that's all. So what was the banner? It was a flag, a banner, a standard. And in the book of Numbers, the first time it's used, and the children of Israel shall pitch their tents, every man by his own camp and every man by his own standard throughout their hosts. And then when they would get ready to go, they would pick up the flag, pick up the standard, and everybody would follow the standard, follow the standard of Judah, follow the standard of Dan, uh, the different camps. When you saw the standard, you knew if you were in the right camp, because that was your standard. She knows she's in the right camp. She knows she's in the right place. His banner over me was love. That's a good standard to be under. So she's dwelling as the bride in a household in which the standard is, or the flag, or that which identifies that household, or that and sometimes it's in the armies, was love. It was love. The standard represents one's family, one's country, and one's worldview and moral compass and heritage. And for God, it is a standard of love. Because when we think about why we come to God through Jesus Christ, it's the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. God shows us his love for us, for God so loved. Yes, that's how we came to Jesus Christ. We came repenting of our sins, recognizing that we had spurned the Lord, and why should we spurn such love? And we had to be brought to that point in which we realized we were spurning love is what we were spurning. Now she, she is invited to this banqueting house. His banner over her is love. So that's, that's a lesson obviously for us men, uh, for those who are heads of households. Uh, those who are heads of households, the banner is love. That's what it is. So you go to Ephesians chapter five, what's the duty of the men? It's to love. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. You know, her duty is to respect. Your duty is to love. That should be the banner of the household, which means that's what you're trying to have as a standard of your household is love, to understand what divine love is, to show what divine love is, to have in your household divine love. And so the husband is the one who's supposed to be, and we fail at it miserably at times and have to repent, but our desire is that our standard would be the love of God in Christ, displayed toward our spouse, toward our children, toward others that we are in contact with that they can see us working with. That should be the standard. That should be the standard. It is the standard. It is the standard whether we meet up with it or not. And it's interesting, there's, there's another Hebrew word. Maybe Micah could help me with the pointings and things. Looks like the exact same word to me, but it's like said a little bit differently, even because even a little dash on it looks the same. And interestingly, it's used only three times in the scriptures, and it's the setting up of the banner. It's the making conspicuous the banner. And it's used twice in the Song of Solomon. Oh, my love, uh, thou art beautiful, oh, my love, as Terza, comely as Jerusalem, terrible as an army with banners. And before that, when it talks about the beloved, my beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest. It's translated chiefest. I didn't look at where all the translations were. Not there yet in Song of Solomon 5. But he's the most conspicuous among the 10,000. He's like the banner among the 10,000. We've already seen that she is conspicuous among the other daughters because she's the lily among the thorns. And then he's going to be the chief among the 10,000 as well. But his banner over me is love. 
Matthew Poole said, by the lifting up or displaying whereof I was invited and encouraged to come to Christ and to list under him, as soldiers are by the lifting up of a banner or ensign of which they see. So if you read any wars, no matter where you are in the war between the states, if, if you saw the flag and you saw the flag of Virginia flying and that was your flag, those were your people, that was your group, that's where your heart was with that flag. And the flag bearers were as important as anybody at those wars because if you took the flag, that was a problem. They, they, they would give the flag to the next guy if that guy got shot and killed and give it to the next one if he got shot and killed. He was a flag bearer. So long as that flag was flying, there was hope. And there was a hope to rally around that flag because everything was about that flag. Your whole heart was in that flag because that flag represented everything about who you were. Everything about who your state was or your nation is, it's the flag, it's the standard. And so here we see the standard for the Christian home is love. And the standard for the Christian church is love. So that the church, the bride says as well, his banner over me is love. His banner over me is love. Matthew Poole says, the love of Christ crucified, which like a banner is displayed in the gospel, whereby sinners are drawn and engaged to come to Christ. The motto or device of Christ's banner was not like those of the other great generals, a lion, a leopard, an eagle, but love by which alone Christ made his conquest and he conquested by love. And it is how he conquests. It is, it is. Now, yes, it's true. Men may come under fear, of con with conviction of sin, but that alone could not save them. If it was just fear, it was just being afraid of going to hell. I was afraid of going to hell when I was a kid. That's why I got saved every single summer camp. Because those guys preached hellfire and brimstone at the Free Methodist camp. And I went forward weeping every year. And I wasn't being saved because I was just afraid. I had not experienced the love of God in Christ. Yes, we should fear God. And he's the one who can cast body and soul in hell. But until you experience not just the fear of God, but also the love of God, you haven't come to salvation yet. You come to salvation when you have experienced the love of God, that he upon the cross pours out his life for his people. Paul writes, look how soldiers are drawn by their colors from place to place and they cleave fast to their ensign. So his love, which he spread forth in my heart was my only banner whereby I was both drawn to him, directed by him, fastened upon him. The love of God in Christ. It's important. The banner is important. So here is the banner for the Christian husband. His duty, his duty is to understand love. His duty is to lead in love. His duty is to overcome by love. His duty is to win and woo by love. So we look at all those passages like in Romans chapter 12, heaping fires, heaping coals of fire upon their head, being good to those who are not being good to you. We're plying love, we're firing out love. Our weaponry is love. And it, it's counterintuitive to everything the world thinks. But as the enemy is wicked to us, we pray for those who despitefully use us and abuse us. So we show them love when they are not showing it to us. So the husband is to persuade by love, speak the truth in love, practice the virtue of love. The Christian man's rallying cry and banner he understands his duty, his path, his goal, his imitation of God. And this is how Christ wooed us and won us. It was a persistent love, a persistent love. Had to be a persistent love. How else would he continue on with such wretches as us when he sends us his word and how often we just ignored it or despised it or just let it go and yet he persisted and brought about this effectual, powerful 
love within the soul of man. And when the Holy Spirit came with great power upon our souls, then we saw, then we saw what this love really was, which is what brought us uh, around by the power of his spirit bringing us to life. Dr. Gill, Dr. Gill writes, a banqueting house where it was distributed and drank, a banquet of wine being put for a feast, here the nuptial feast, and may design the gospel feast in the house of God, where there's plenty of the wine of gospel truths, the provision of rich food of which the believers are sweetly refreshed, delightfully regaled, and to be brought hither under the drawing and influences of divine grace, a special privilege, a distinguishing layout, and shows a great condescension in Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, to take his people by the hand, as it were, and introduce them into his house, so well furnished, and to a table so well spread. And so the church relates it as an instance of divine favor and a fresh token of Christ's love to her. The great immutable, undescribable almost God who works with these little people on earth, raising their little fists at him, trying to figure out other ways in their little minds. And I agree with Gil. He takes us by the hand and he says, now, stop that. You're full of sin. Let me show you what I got. And he breaks us concerning our sin, and then he brings us into the house of wine, of joy, and of delights. And he says, now, would you not rather be in this house than in the house of the world? What does the world have for you? What has the world ever done for you? What riches has it given to you? What kind of what kind of clear conscience has the world ever given you? The world hasn't given you any clear conscience. It's only hurt your conscience because of your sin against it. How has the world benefited you eternally? It never benefits you eternally because it can only see the present. How has the world helped your family along? It doesn't. It hurts your family. It destroys your family. It makes things hard in your family. The world has done nothing for you. And so Christ comes, and this is why she is regaled. This is why she is delighting in all of this when she says, he brought me into his banqueting table, which indicates a bringing in and sitting down at the feast and his banner over me was love. In other words, this is not just he didn't do it for other motives or other reasons. And there's certainly nothing we can give. What could she give to him? What could she give to Solomon? She had nothing that he didn't already have of this world, but she had love that she could give him. And this is, this is the saints. This is what the saints give to the Lord. When the Lord gives to them salvation, the saints give back their love their appreciation, their thankfulness, all the things that are required of them um, because of what the Lord has done for them. He brought me into his banqueting table. His banner, his standard over me was love. And that's what it is. So God is love, yes. It's not the only thing he is, but he is that. And the love that he has shown to us is persistent, consistent, constant, faithful, and it brings us back time and time again to the realization of all we owe him, which is everything, and an astonishing love, a divine love that he is willing to bestow upon us. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these admonitions in the way that we should, as husbands, lead our homes and lead in the church and lead in the state and in all things that that we would understand and learn this divine love, uh, that which we don't have, and we have none of it. And you have to bestow all of it upon us for us to even understand it. And that we have to be uh, dwelling in you and abiding in you in order to manifest such love. We have to have the life of Christ 
<coughs> flowing in and through us to others. It's no longer I who lives, <coughs> but Christ who lives in me. In the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That is our, our understanding, our rallying cry. We pray that you would fill us again with a sense, a proper sense of the love that you have bestowed upon us, uh, that we might in turn show it forth uh, to our homes and to the world. We pray in Christ's name, amen.